Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, um, you are a good God, Lord. And there are times in our lives when um, the world will rail against us saying, no, God is not good. But biblically, the truth is you are a good God. And Father, bad things happen. Grievous things happen. Things that hurt our hearts and break our hearts and impact our souls happen. And that's what's happened to the Warren family this weekend. Um, as their 27-year-old son took his own life, God, we pray for them. Uh, we pray for comfort for Rick and Kay. We pray for wisdom for them to know how to lead their church and, and to speak to. I'm sure there'll be media requests for his time and his response. Give him wisdom, Father, on how to respond, what to say, um, how to deal with it. Uh, these are pressures that many of us will never fully understand uh, the weight that they bear in these kinds of scenarios and situations. So we, so we just pray for them and leave them in your care, God, knowing that um, even in the midst of this pain and uh, brokenness, there's still a plan that you will have to, uh, to deal with this and to, to help them work through it. And so we just commit them into your care. And here, Lord, at Cornerstone, we thank you for the work that you're doing in our midst. We thank you for uh, your blessing upon us as a church family. Um, we thank you, God, for the team that just got back from Haiti and for uh, the impact that they had there as well as the impact that you had upon their hearts and souls by taking them there and showing them a, a developing country and a, a ministry that's trying to do very tangible, uh, loving things in the name of Jesus Christ to help their own um, people, their own country. And so allow that to settle into their souls, Lord. Allow them to now impact us as, as sort of um, salt in the, in the midst of us that, uh, that their heart and vision for getting the the incredible message of Jesus Christ out to the world would um, affect and affect us, God, in many different ways so that we can be the church that you're calling us to be. So we give you the praise, Lord. We give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Walking in the light. Um, one of the things growing up I can remember was uh, you get together some friends and you want to watch a scary movie. And so you, you, you get the movie and you, you turn down the lights because scary movies are always best watched in the dark. And, and that's one of the big images about scary movies is that they don't do a scary movie in broad daylight, do they? They're not much scary about broad daylight. No, they do it in the dark. And I guess as I've gotten older, I've been less inclined to want to watch that kind of stuff simply because I've become too analytical. And, and so when they're walking into that room that's got no lights and they know that the killer's inside, it's like, to me, I'm thinking, turn the light on. That's the first idea I have. She just walked by six dead bodies. She saw the door open, the door close, and she goes to open up the door, and it's all dark, and so she just goes in. It's like everything in you is yelling, no, there's a bad person in there, and they're going to hurt you. Do not go in in the dark, or else at the very least, as soon as you walk in, turn the lights on. But they seem to walk in and go right past the light switch. I never understood that about scary movies. And like even you say, well, maybe the lights don't work. Well, everybody's got cell phones nowadays. Turn your cell phone on and it'll light the room up a little bit and so you can see. But oh no, they got to do it in the dark because it's a scary movie, right? All of us know what it is to though, have those times when we can sort of sense that we're in the dark. We don't know what to do. If you're the parent of a teenager, you've been in the dark. You could be in the dark right now as a parent of a teenager. You're thinking, I'm not sure really how to handle this. I don't know what the next thing is to say. I don't know how to deal with this. How, what, what I should be doing as a parent. They feel very much in the dark. Husbands, when your wife turns to you and asks if this outfit makes me look fat, you are in the dark. You have no idea where the light switch is. You wish there was a way to turn on the light and get out. But you're in that room and you don't know what to say or what to do and you're in the dark. We know what it is, this image of light and darkness plays with us all the time throughout life. And John takes us into this image in 1 John chapter 1. And I invite you in your Bibles to turn with me there as we look at what he's talking about when it says that there's this idea of spiritual darkness and spiritual light. And we want to walk through that passage this morning. And so you can listen as I read to us the first few verses of the passage this morning. In 1 John chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 5. John says... This is the message we have heard from him, that's from Jesus, and declare to you. Remember back up further, if we were here last Sunday, we talked about John was an eyewitness. He makes that very clear in the first part of verse John. And we talked about the gospel of John, how uh, John was there when Jesus called him. John was there when Jesus went to the cross. John was there when he went to the empty tomb. John was there when he had a chance to actually touch Jesus in the resurrected form. And so when he says he's an eyewitness, it puts him into a category that, that gives him this authority to say the things that he's saying here in 1 John. John wrote the gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Those are all books in the Bible that he wrote, and here he's talking in terms of being an eyewitness. And so he says, this is the message that we have heard from Jesus and declared to you. So he's got this message from Jesus. It says, God is light. 
And in him there is no darkness at all. So light, darkness. Verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And I'll explain the context of that verse in just a few moments. Verse 9, a verse that many of us, if we've grown up in the church, will be familiar with. It says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he, that's Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Chapter 2, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Chapter 2, verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. As is our custom, we'll work through this passage and try to break it down so we can understand it. First of all, John 1, verses 5 through to 7, tells very clearly that God is light. God is light. John's going to tell us very much as well that he knows this because he was an eyewitness to the light. John saw Jesus, John heard Jesus, John saw Jesus, and John touched Jesus. Jesus. And so he uses this as a basis for where he's going. Remember, if you were here last Sunday, we talked about how John ter- talked in terms of uh, uh, him being able to touch Jesus. And, and I just asked the question what would have that been like for this guy, John, to write down that I touched the eternal one? What was that like for John to think in terms of he knew that Jesus was from the Father, so no beginning, no end, and Jesus was the one that John had actually touched with his hands. And we read about the Last Supper that he actually reclined on Jesus' chest. He was sitting there at the Last Supper in that position. I'm sure it must have just boggled John's brain to think in terms of I have actually physically touched eternity in the person of Jesus Christ. That must have been amazing. We don't need a much of an imagination to be wowed by this idea of John having this experience that so few had. And so in 1 John 1 verse 5, he says that we have this message. We have this message that we have heard from Jesus. And because John was an eyewitness and, and, and saw Jesus and heard Jesus, he says, we're going to declare the message to you. And this is the message God is like. What's he saying? He's telling us something about the character of God. John, is, John says that God is light. So... Light, darkness, not just unique to John himself. If we go back into the Old Testament, we could trace through the same imagery. But let me just give you one verse of scripture. 2 Samuel 22, verse 29. There, David writing, and he says, You are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord turns my darkness into light. You are my lamp. In other words, you're my light, and you turn my darkness into light. And so John or not, not John, David, understanding that the only way in which he was going to have light to see his world properly, light to see spiritually, was by having an encounter with his heavenly father. And so John carries the same idea on. If we were to look at the gospel of John, another book that John actually wrote, and we look at John chapter 12, verse 46, he's quoting Jesus here when Jesus said, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And so obviously there's an assumption here by Jesus that there's darkness in the world, we are all part of that darkness, and he has come as the light, and so if we want to be able to see the light, if we want to be able to see the way in which God calls us to, then we need to have this connection with Jesus Christ. All right? He's the light. I have come into the world as a light, Jesus says of himself in John chapter 12, verse 46. Well, scholars tell us too in verse 5, that there's two parts to this phrase about God being light. It says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And and there's nothing tricky there, really. It's just uh, once it's stated in the positive, God is light, and then the exact same thing is stated in the negative by saying, and in him there's no darkness at all. So there's nothing tricky about that. It's just stating the same thing two different ways as was uh, their natural way of looking at the world and making those kinds of observations. God is light, positive. Negatively, in him is no darkness at all. Same message both ways. So, John is telling us something about God's character. Verse 5. Now, verse 6, what we believe has to affect how we live. Look what it says in verse 6. If we claim, so he's told us that God is light, so if we claim to have fellowship with him, with the one who's the light, yet walk in darkness, 
So here's that imagery again, light and darkness. So if I claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Now, so what John is saying here is that knowing that God is light, we need to understand how that then affects us. What do we mean? Well, if there's no darkness in God and he's the light, then if I'm walking and living in darkness, then there's a problem here. Because somehow I haven't connected the dots that if I say I'm going to know God and be connected to the one who is the light, then my life has to be a reflection of the fact that I live with the one who has the light, who is the light, Jesus. So what I believe has to affect how I live. I've said that many times from the front of this church here. What I believe has to affect how I live. Because if it doesn't affect how I, believe, how I live, then there's a question as to whether I really believe it or not. Okay? What I believe has to affect how I live. So it's not just about agreeing to a set of beliefs. It's about saying, this is what I believe, and it affects then how I live my life, how I work it out, how I see my life day after day after day. Now, some of us here this morning may get a pass on this as well. What do I mean by that? Well, in verse 6, look what it says. It says, if we claim to have fellowship with him. In other words, if I claim to be a follower of Jesus. And so it could be that you're here this morning, and you've never made that claim. That's okay. Verse 6, you have nothing to worry about in verse 6 for you at all. All right? Verse 6 is for those individuals who would call themselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, and are saying one thing, but they're not living it out. And so if you haven't claimed to follow Jesus Christ, in verse 6, you, you get a pass on that. That's not a problem at all. It's only for those who have made that claim, that proclamation, hey, I am a Christian, I follow Jesus Christ, then John goes on to say, but you're not walking like it, well, then we have a problem. Okay? Now, look at verse 7. He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. What's he saying? Well, he's saying walking with God provides fellowship with other believers. Now, that's very interesting to note because you would think the logical way of stating this would be if we walk in the light as God or Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with him. That's what you would think it would say. But it doesn't say that. Look what it says. It says if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with other believers. That's interesting. It's like a demonstration of our having a right relationship with Jesus Christ is seen in our fellowship with other believers who have that right relationship with Jesus Christ. Quite interesting. You see, if I keep on isolating myself from other believers, thinking that somehow I have some kind of superior knowledge and they're not doing what they should be doing, that doesn't, that's not an indication of my immense spirituality, that may be in case an, uh, an indication of my lack of spirituality. It's important to note that John says, if we walk in the light. So the assumption is that the person is following the truths of Scripture, then we're going to have fellowship with others. It's a warning sign that if I keep on isolating myself from other believers, people who have announced that they're Christians, and somehow I may think, well, they don't do this or they don't do that, and I keep finding all the different things that are separation, and I keep isolating, 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 that may not be at all an indication of me walking in the light. Because walking in the light, John says, leads me to have fellowship with other believers. So we need to be honest as Christians, though. There are lots of stuff as Christians that we don't necessarily all agree on. There's a number of different theological issues. We could talk about whether it's eternal security or whether it's uh, uh, the, the, the tribulation or, or about uh, oh, the rapture. There's a number of different theological issues that Christians don't agree on. And so the Bible doesn't call us to isolate when we disagree with other believers. Speaking in tongues, another big issue within the, the church. And so, but what it calls us to do is, is we can have debate about those things and still walk together as believers who don't agree on some of those issues. Separation doesn't indicate my spirituality. And down through the ages, there have been brilliant men and women who have debated and discussed some of these theological issues and have never come to a point where they've said, okay, we've laid that one to rest. We'll never disagree with this again. Here it is, it's all crystal clear because to this very day, there's still books being written and debates being had about different issues of Scripture. Does that mean then as soon as I find something to disagree with somebody about, I isolate and move away from them? No. No. We acknowledge that, hey, we don't get along on this, but we still fellowship with each other. Why? Because of 1 John. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The focus point, again, being Jesus Christ. That's the center point of our agreement. Well, let's move on. Chapter 1, verses 8 through to 10, tells us that we need to be honest about our sin. 
We need to be honest about our sin. Look at verse 8. John writes and says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. What's going on there? Well, a little history for us. In John's day, there was this group of people who were spiritual elitists. They, they believed that they had sort of a corner on truth and they were above other believers. And so they isolated themselves and in fact were causing problems within the local churches there that John wants to write and correct this teaching. And so one of their things was that they were so spiritually superior that they didn't sin. And so look what he says in verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so that's the context of verse 8. And I don't know that that's much of a problem today within the evangelical world where we have such a spiritual elitism where we say, well, uh, we don't even sin. I I think the problem is seen in another way in the evangelical church. It's seen in in an idea or a casualness to this uh, approach that, well, you know, I'm not really a bad person. And we can sort of come down to the lowest common denominator and sort of think, well, you know, entrance into heaven is really about you know being a good person and just making sure that you don't do really bad things and so if I've never done anything really bad then I'm not a bad person and that's a dangerous ground to begin treading upon we know there's all kinds of bad examples in our world and when I compare myself then to those bad examples I can sort of think well I'm not like them I'm not a bad person like them and so That's how God's going to accept me is because I'm not a bad person. Well, we need to elevate the discussion beyond good or bad. We need to move the discussion to this idea of whether we're sinful or perfect. Because that's what Jesus was about. Jesus came... It says, we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins. Well, if I'm not a bad person, then I probably don't need forgiveness, and now I've gotten into a trouble with doing, well, what's the point of Jesus even coming then? Jesus came to die on a cross. Jesus came to pay the price for my salvation. Jesus came and lived the perfect sinless life, the scriptures tell us. When he was on that cross, he had committed no sin, and finally the sin of the world was put upon him on that cross, and he paid the price for us. And so it's not about whether I'm good or bad. It's about whether or not I've responded to the perfect, sinless one, Jesus Christ, or not. That's the question. You see... When we look at verse 9, we see that confession is actually some, maybe we heard this a long time ago, that confession is good for the soul. It actually is good for the soul. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, so these spiritual elitists had claimed to be without sin, and John says, whoa, whoa, if you claim to be without sin, you've deceived yourself, because we've all sinned. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But the choice is ours, isn't it? Verse 9 starts off with, if. So this isn't about the family that I was born into. This isn't about the the church that I grew up in. This isn't about me being a good person or a bad person. This is about me recognizing, do I understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my salvation to deal with my sin? The reason we can say confession is good for the soul is because of the result we see in verse 9. There's two different things that we see. One is that we get forgiveness, and that's a, a, a legal term. To forgive means literally to let go of as in a debt. So when God says, I'll forgive you, he's letting go of that sin that we have committed. He lets go of that, and we're not held accountable for that. And then what says to purify us, that means that he cleanses it in such a way that there's not even the hint of stain of sin in our lives. So verse 9 says, if we will confess our sins, he will forgive us. That's remove the debt, and he will cleanse us. That means there's not even a hint of a stain of my sin anymore because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's what. But it starts off, verse 9 does, with the word if. Not everybody gets it. It's if we ask for it, we get it. If we come to him, we get it. If we come and admit that I need him, we get it. If we come to him and ask him to forgive us our sins, we get it. Not because of where I've been born, not because of my parents, not because of my grandparents, not because of the money I gave or the things that I've done or the deeds that I've done or the church that I attend or anything else. We only get it if we come to him individually and ask for it. That incredible work that we just celebrated last weekend on Easter of Jesus dying on a cross was for us as individuals to respond to it. So verse 9 says, if 
we confess our sins. Verse 10 reminds us that spiritual elitism doesn't even work. Look what he says in verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, you can just imagine he's writing to these spiritual elitists who have said that they don't sin. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. In other words, what John is saying is that we're actually attacking the very character of God. Because God's the one who told us that we've sinned. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. John says that there's this clear understanding that we need to bring our lives to God and understand who he is. He's the light. I'm not the light. None of us as individuals are the light. Jesus is the light. So I need to come to him, and I'll never find the light by the work of my good deeds or anything else. I only find the light when I give my life to Christ and ask him to forgive me. There are serious results. Look at the, it says at the verse, end of verse 10. It says, if we claim that we have not sinned, the serious results are this. We make him out to be a liar. We attack the character of God, and his word has no place in our lives. His word can either be the truth of scripture or the word being Jesus Christ himself. So either way, it's bad. If I say I haven't sinned, I've got no problem, I'm a good person, then I've got an issue with God. Because God says, then your, the, my word has no place in your lives. And so our danger, again, here, as evangelicals in many respects, isn't so much in saying that we've never sinned. Our danger is in saying that we've never done anything bad. Sin is sin. The line that God establishes is where sin is. And so if I've lied... You say, well, it's not a big deal. Well, according to God's word, it is, yes, because that means I've sinned. If I've done anything at all, I've had that impure thought, I've said that wrong word, I've, 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 whatever the case may be, if we think how small it may be, if it crosses the line of God's standard of sin, then that's when I know that I need to have his forgiveness. It's not, not about me being a good person or a bad person, it's about me having a relationship with Jesus Christ or not having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's so important for us to understand this morning. We wrap it up in chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. We see this, that the only answer for our sin actually is Jesus. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, the one who speaks, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. We are a people in process. And here's where sometimes the danger lies. Um, A study just came out within this past calendar year called um, Hemorrhaging Faith. And it's a Canadian study. I just received a copy of it this past week. Um, done by James Penner, who's a sociologist at the University of Lethbridge. And uh, researched why young Canadians are leaving the church. And so, Hemorrhaging Faith is the title of the study. And then the subtitle is, Why and When Canadian Young Adults Are Leaving, Staying, or Returning to the Church. One of the interesting conclusions that they come to is that when young people leave the church, they leave out of this disconnect of faith having any connection to the real world, to their real life, to their day-to-day activities. And so when they hear about just being a good person or just attending church or, or dressing certain ways or, or just behaving in certain ways, but they don't see that it actually impacts anything, then they disconnect from life and they walk away from the church. Interesting. Pastor Stephen has just returned from Haiti with a group of young adults who have been down there doing a missions trip. One of the connecting forces that they, James Penner comes up with in this study is that when young people go on missions trips, this gives them a viable connection to the reality of how faith connects to the real world and it helps them then to stay the course in their journey with Jesus Christ. Fascinating. Mission trips are a huge part of a healthy young person's experience of walking the walk over a long period of time in their lives. And so at Cornerstone, we are extremely committed to this idea. Why? Because of the health that it not only is, but it also produces over the long haul for our young people to stay the course in walking with their faith through through a long period of time. Healthy, good stuff. But when they hear us say one thing and disconnect by how we live in another way, then they look at that and say, well, my faith, uh, the church has got nothing for me. And so at Cornerstone, we're huge believers in the fact that uh, our faith is incredibly practical day by day by day. One of the songs that we sang earlier, it said, every hour I need thee. Why? Because it's fundamentally important that I don't disconnect from God from Sunday to Sunday and say, well, Monday to Saturday, I actually got nothing to do with my life. You see, I do worship on Sundays. No, that's not a spiritual journey. That's a religious thing that you've gotten into. 
Our faith is profoundly impactful in our day-to-day living, and if it isn't, then we are going to find ourselves walking away ultimately saying, well, that's just religion, and I don't want that. Jesus Christ is practical. Jesus Christ is necessary every single day of our lives. And so at Cornerstone, we keep on hammering this idea of the practicality of our faith impacting that what we believe affects how we live. And as I sat with Gil Clausen, the executive director of uh, Youth for Christ, and he went over the study because Youth for Christ was one of the um, uh, people that prompted and, and helped fund this study. He said, Rusty, I think that's one of the good things about Cornerstone, as I've seen what's going on there, is that uh, you've got young families growing in your church. You've got uh, the college age demographic is growing in your church. And he says it's because of the practicality of making sure that the message is seen in tangible ways of how it affects everyday life. So important. So important. So John chapter 2 says, Dear children, you'll see this phrase used again and again by John. It's a pastoral phrase. He cares about these people. He's like, guys, come on. I write this to you so that you will not sin. Well, how is it that he says we won't sin when he's just finished saying that we're going to sin? And if we say we haven't sinned, then we've got a problem. Well, there's two possible ways scholars say that we could look at this. First of all, John's saying to them, don't sin by saying you don't sin. All right? Don't sin by saying you don't sin because you do sin. And the good news is is that Jesus is our advocate. He's the one who will stand in our defense. He's the one that we can go to and ask for forgiveness. Or or the second way that we could look at that is John saying, you know what, I don't want to open this door to a license to sin. In other words, I I don't want you to think that, well, you're going to sin, so it doesn't matter then how you live, so you can just go and do all the sinning you want. No, Paul addressed that greatly in the book of Romans. We don't go on sinning so that grace may increase. He says, by no means, we died to sin. And so we're not going to allow it to live in our lives. We're not going to allow it to have access there. But the reality is is that because we're human and we're still on part of this process and this journey, we do sin. We screw up. And the good news is, it says in chapter 2, verse 1, if, but if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our hope. We just came through this Easter weekend talking about the price that he paid for our salvation He's our hope. But he's not only our hope, as it says in chapter 2, verse 1. Look what it says in chapter 2, verse 2. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is the hope for our world. Last month, I got on an airplane in Calgary to fly down to Phoenix. and I'm, When I fly, I, I, I'm not a gabber. I'm not a, a big social guy on the airplane. I come in, I sit down, and I generally am reading or something, and, and so uh, get in beside a guy who's uh, got the window seat, and I like an aisle seat, and so we sit down together and stuff, and we're barely taken off on the tarmac when uh, he just turns to me and um, starts commenting about the weather. Well, that's a pretty easy topic to cover, right? And uh, he's thinking that the weather's not too bad because he lives in Calgary, and I said, no, no, you need to live where I live. The weather is bad. And so we chatted about the weather for a little bit. And he said, oh, yeah, I've been to Saskatoon. He said, man, it's cold there. And I'm like, yeah, all right. So uh, we chat for a little bit and stuff. And then he just keeps on asking me questions. And finally, we get to the big question of, oh, what do you do in Saskatoon? And so that question generally has a screeching halt in most conversations. <laughs> when I say I'm the lead pastor at Cornerstone Church, I say, yeah, and off they go and are by themselves. And so in this particular equation, I said, I'm the lead pastor at Cornerstone Church. Well, that opened up a whole window of questions he had for me. He said, well, how's that working out for you? I said, well, not bad, actually. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm really excited about our church. I'm excited about what God's doing in our midst. He goes, well, what do you mean by that? So we ended up having this long conversation about our church and, and some of the growth that we're seeing. And, and he says, well, uh, why are you growing? And I said, well, I think it's the message that we preach. He says, you mean about God? I said, well, yeah, and his son, Jesus Christ. And so we have this conversation, but he says, well, but a lot of churches talk about God. And I said, yeah, but I said, I think there's this practicality. And so we go into this message about how our faith affects how we live. And he starts to see these lights, or he, I start to see these lights turn on with him and stuff. And he starts talking about his own walk and how he goes to church, but his own kids have walked away from the church. And I'm thinking, his family's part of this here. The hemorrhaging of faith. The kids have walked away from church. And so we chatted for much of the flight then about how if what I believe doesn't impact how I live, then it probably isn't true of what I believe. And, and he's like, wow, I hadn't really thought of that that way before. And we had this great conversation and ultimately talked about Jesus being the hope 
not only for the people in the church, but for the world. And so as a church family, we try to get that word out. And as we get that word out, what we find is that we have growth and other people are coming to hear about who Jesus Christ is and what he can do in their lives. Light and darkness. Every month, I get a prayer bulletin update from a ministry called Ratanak International. Ratanak International is based in Cambodia started by a Canadian um, former RCMP officer whose heart was broken by the issue of human trafficking. And so he set up this ministry in Cambodia and he works there and he's been there for quite a while. And sometimes there's just heart, heartbreaking stories in what he writes. Let me just share with you a little bit as we conclude this morning. He says, I was being interviewed on the side of a Phnom Penh street for a TV show. It was impossible to concentrate. Across from me was a young man, apparently mentally ill, obviously recently beaten and dressed as a young girl. The image of him sitting on a bench twitching and shaking was absolutely heartbreaking, a spectacle of human brokenness on display for us. In Cambodia, many little boys are repeatedly sexually abused by tourist pedophiles. They grew up both physically and psychologically damaged and often many struggle with gender confusion. They are relegated to the fringes of Cambodian society which despises and ostracizes them. They are subject to public scorn, beatings, and insults which force them to retreat from daylight and many of them only come out late at night. That boy, there's the image right there, light and darkness. They're forced from the daylight and they're scattered into the darkness because they're ostracized, they're beaten, they're put on the fringes of society. They're rejected by their families, they're devoid of hope and, few ha- and have few contacts other than with those who continue to abuse them. They represent for me lives of almost complete dislocation and despair. I don't know about you, but I find such circumstances completely overwhelming. How could any hope ever be restored to such lives? Yet, and then he goes on to tell the story of how they're doing that very thing for many of these young men, young boys who have been beaten, ostracized, and put into shameful, shameful situations. Why? Because Brian McConaughey, the founder of Ratanak International, believes that 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, is the message that we've got to get out. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, our message isn't about us staying together as a church family. Our message is about us coming together as a church family to find out again what the instructions are for us to go out and live our lives because it practically impacts every single day of how we live our lives. And part of that process is getting the word out that Jesus is the hope. And if we as a church family aren't doing that, then we're missing the boat on what is the most fundamental call that we have, not only by God, but also by God to our world in which we live. And there's a world that's so full of hopelessness and despair that they need to hear that Jesus loves them. They need to hear that Jesus is the hope. They need to hear that God loves them and things can change and their lives can be changed by the very grace of God.